beautiful Friday morning here in Central America. We're at our secret hideaway base in very, very, very rural Oklahoma. Here to talk to you about a very important topic that I'm sure you all will relish called bile. Called bile. Yep. But you guys are going to love this. This is a, this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, I know everybody's like, well, Chip's talking about bile. It, 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 and we're going to talk about mucus probably pretty soon, too. So we're going to get in there, right? So we're going to get in the sewer of, of how you work and, and, and really uh, these processes that uh, are not well studied but are super duper important to your immune system and your immune health in the bacterial hijack. So glad you guys can be here today. Um, today, I think, is a very important day in history. We had some interesting things happen with a, a past president yesterday. Um, and I think this is a turning point for our country. So uh, hoorah, or hoorah, as your case may be. So anyway, let's get into it today. So let's talk about um, the importance of bile. Yes, we're going to go there. Um, and you guys are probably thinking, oh my, this is going to be dull and boring. Uh, stick around till the end because you're going to love how this one wraps up. It's pretty cool, okay? So here we go. So so you guys have heard me talk many, many times about, you know, the act of eating, right? And, and what I'm showing you here, and you guys can look this up. This is a new field of scientific study called chrono nutrition or chronobiology or chronophysiology or chronomicrobiology or how you want to look at it. But, you know, this is new work. So 2017 Nobel Prize, although it's been developing, you know, over time. But what it says is that all we have this genetic expression that literally runs by the sun. And, and so if you're religious at all or, you know, spiritual at all, I think that should, you know, really ring to you as a, as a real truth that we operate by the sun. Um, we operate literally. We run our testosterone, our melatonin, our blood pressure, our cardiovascular efficiency, our muscular strength, our reaction time our body temperature and our sleep are all run by the sun. Yeah. So isn't that cool? I mean, that's really, really cool. And I think this is just deeply, deeply, deeply spiritual. Um, so again, we'll get into bile in a second. <laughs> we have to start somewhere. So, but I think this is really deeply spiritual and, and understanding this is, is really higher truth. Okay. So I, you know, I consider myself an alchemist, right? So what does that mean? Well, it means I study higher truth and, and this is a big one, boys and girls, and this has been proved. And that's what I'm telling you. It's been proved, you know, by mainstream science even, um in 2017 and and been given a nobel prize okay so this is how you work right so this is how you sort of run throughout the day um you can look at this and sort of you know when should we eat in this i mean your guess is as good as mine but to me it looks like later you know, so um, again, as we're starting to kind of wind down this fastest reaction time, which looks like happens about 3.30, um, you know, our greatest cardiovascular and muscular strength about five o'clock. So, so maybe about the time that our blood pressure and temperature is ramping up, you know, that's a good time to eat. So 6.30, 7 o'clock at night. Uh, and then we go to sleep, you know, when melatonin starts, right? And that looks to be uh, at about nine o'clock at night, uh, which is really cool. So anyway, this is how you work, right? So you work in line with the sun. We sort of go through these natural expressions of stuff. Um, and very important to understand this. Uh, by the way, look at melatonin here. So melatonin secretion starts at 2100. Melatonin secretion stops at 7300. Guess what also starts and stops at those two times? Your genetic expression. 
So if I give you melatonin at noon, here it's straight up on this clock, right? If I give you melatonin at noon, does nothing, nothing, because you don't have any genes open. They're all closed to melatonin. All right, so the greatest and most disruptive act that we do to ourselves every day is eat food, okay? And again, we're gonna talk about bile, but we got to talk about sort of these higher ideas and processes before we get to bile. So the greatest and most disruptive thing that we do to ourselves every day is eat because we screw up this. So again, if your body's trying to build hormones at a certain time and we eat, you got to stop. Now you've got to deal with the meal that you just shoved down your maw, right? Okay. And so look at this though. I want you to Look at this in terms of, of sort of um, consider yourself a vehicle, consider yourself a machine and efficiency, right? Efficiency. So if I eat a watermelon, does that have nutritional value? Yes. It's got protein. It's got fiber. It's got a lot of stuff. I blow through that guy in 20 minutes. By the way, if I drink whoop, just straight amino acids, how long does it take me to digest that? not very long. Why are we building straight amino acid supplements for that reason? Okay, so if I eat oranges and grapes, 30 minutes. If I eat apples, pears, and cherries, 40 minutes. And you can read down the list, but, and again, fish. So let's look at meat. So pro, we all got to have protein because, not because we have to have protein. Protein is nothing but fat and amino acids. So the important things there are not protein, they're fat and amino acids, okay? Fat and amino acids are how we work, how we run. But look at fish, 30 to 60 minutes. Man, we're efficient with fish, aren't we? Look at beef, three to four hours. Look at cheese, three to four and a half hours. Look at pork, four to five hours. Uh, what should we be eating there, Billy? <laughs> I think it's 30 to 60 minutes or a little amino acid drink bleep, that we drink and we get everything that we need, right? So super important to understand, first of all. So again, higher concepts, uh, what eating does to you higher concepts, what should you eat? And again, it, we've done lots of stuff on fats and lots of stuff on amino acids, you can go find that. But just as to your digestion and how long it takes you to break down things. Now, how do you get omega-3s, you know, naturally? So let's say we didn't have, uh, you know, alpha-linolenic acid that we could take as a supplement, which we don't have, but, um, Let's say we have to go straight to the peas and, and beans and stuff. One and a half to two hours. Okay, I'll take that. I just don't like this four to five hours, do you? Again, this is all about work that your body, your body wants to defend itself. That is the number one thing that your body needs to do. Defend itself with your immune system. If your body can't defend itself, then you're going to die. Yeah, of a pathogen. If your body can't defend itself, your body will die of a pathogen. What is the most disruptive thing that you do to your immune system every day? Eat. And again, depending on what you eat, that's how disruptive it is to your immune system. I'm really glad we ate tuna last night, Cindy. <laughs> um, so anyway, we're, we are here at our secret location uh, deep in rural Oklahoma uh, today. Um, and we also have our dogs here, as you can hear. Okay, so bile, um, and sorry, but it, that's just life and then life happens. So bile, what is bile? Um, well, bile is certain acids, and we'll talk about that in a second, but bile is made in the liver and it's stored in the gallbladder. So again, if you've had your gallbladder removed, that is not ideal, 
because uh, you need a storage mechanism, but you're still going to make bile and you're still going to kind of go through this stuff, but you may be disbalanced and, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so bile helps with digestion. Again, so in order for you to deal with this stuff that you just ate, you have to have bile because bile helps you break it down. I mean, you're not going to process the beef that you just ate just right through everything, all your intestines and all that. You have to break it down because you have to break it down for the, and again, what are you looking for? Fats and proteins. I mean, fats and amino acids. Sorry, protein is just fats and amino acids. So that's what your body is looking for. But bile helps you break down those things, okay? Um, it's it, very important in the absorption of fats and it's important in the excretion of fats. Now, one of the things that we're going to talk about here through the course of this, and you'll hear me talk a lot about in the course of the pathogenesis of disease, is that fats build up in cells in disease. That's part of the pathogenesis of any almost any uh, non-traumatic, let's say, disease is that you'll have a buildup of fats in cells, okay? So uh, comp what are the composition of, of bile? Well, it's bile salts, and we're gonna talk a lot about them, guys. It's phospholipids, and you know, phospholipids are involved in the bacterial hijack. If you go back a week to Chip Talks and listen to my bacterial hijack, you're going to hear me talk about a lot about phospholipids, and again, phospholipids are involved here. Um, cholesterol is absolutely involved in this, so if you're dysregulated in cholesterol, again, likely you're dysregulated in bile. Um, isn't that interesting? And then we're going to uh, sort of, and that's a small percentage, but in the bile pigments, in, in the composition of bile, this is what this is talking about, there are cholesterols, but you'll see how cholesterol is involved here, right here in this slide. Chip, you're a perfect straight man to yourself. Thank you, Chip. Um, okay, so bile, um, what is it composed of? Well, again, it's built from cholesterol, all right? And, and, and that is a very important notion because um, what does cholesterol do in your body? And most of us would go, uh, I don't know. And cholesterol is 40 something percent of your brain. I don't remember right off the top of my head. Um, it is uh, deeply involved in the structure of every cell. So you can't really build a cell without cholesterol. Um, when a bacteria needs to hijack us, one of the things that they need to be able to do is suck up our resources so that they can build cell walls and reproduce, right? And the way they do that is they hijack these processes. And again, we'll talk about that more in a second. But as to bile, so what is bile? Well, cholesterol is broken down toward these two pathways. By the way, the red pathway, kind of ignore. I mean, sorry, it was a good, good slide there. Um, murin means mouse, okay? If you didn't know that or, you know, again, it, if, it, if, it, if you don't read studies, you probably don't know that. You know, obviously canine, most of us know, means dog. Um, but if, if you're reading studies and you see murin or murine, however you want to pronounce it, uh, that means mouse, okay? So ignore the red over there. That's what, you know, mice do. You don't do that. You're not a mammal. Um, but you can see how cholesterol is broken down through uh, two, and these are cytochrome P450 pathways, so that's why they're CYP pathways, broken down into, through two pathways into cholic acid and then CDCA, which again is a long, giant word. You can, you know, look, we'll talk about it in a second. But those are further conjugated by uh, uh, commiserate bacteria into something called LCA and UDCA or DCA. And those are called secondary bile acids. But this is a sort of a balancing process between all these bile acids. And so your body wants to balance, you know, kind of between CA and CDCA, and then the breakdowns of those through uh, basically bacterial action. So does this matter? You know, should we pay attention to bile acids? Well, this is kind of in health and disease, okay? 
So you can see on the left there, I've circled or uh, squared the boxes um, on the control population. And then also I've squared the boxes on the patient population under this study under bile acids. And these are people that have um, liver disease, okay? So active liver disease. And you can see kind of the difference here. So it's dramatic, right? So in, in total bile acids, you have in the controls, you have, you know, 9.3, and then you have literally uh, almost six times that much in, in people who are not uh, healthy, who have liver disease. And um, you can see which ones are most dysregulated. And again, it's going to be the UDCA, which is a breakdown. So that, again, is going to be sort of a bacterial thing. So if you look at UDCA, it's under secondary bile acids. And you can see microbial modifications there. So that's going to indicate that, you know, something is making more UDCA than LCA. All right, so see LCA here, and again, LCA is pretty shut down as to ratio in health and disease, but UDCA is amped up. And you'll see why that's beneficial to bacteria or the bacterial hijack here in a second. Okay, <clears throat> so what do bile acids do and why are they important? Like if I'm a bacteria, why, why am I gonna hijack your bile acids? Well, kind of for this reason, I don't want a lot of LCA, and you'll see that in a second. And UDCA doesn't, it, it helps me, it doesn't really hurt me. So I want UDCA over LCA, let's say. So I want to tip those scales in one way over the other if I'm a bacteria and I want to invade you. Um, so the bacterial hijack would be shut down by a type 2 M2 type immune response. So again, if I'm a bacteria, I want to force, you have two types of immune response, innate and adaptive, M1 and M2, Th1 and Th2, however you want to explain it. Um, but in adapt or innate immunity wants to just go out and kill immunity uh, immediately. And what that means is that you will differentiate stem cells in a certain way. They'll be, they call it polarization. So they'll be polarized to go kill right? There'll be a certain type. Um, bacteria don't like it if you polarize the other way, which is an M2 or Th2 type response. And that's when you build all of these, this stuff on white blood cells like antibodies and all of these things that really help you defend yourself and, and what's needed really to kind of break, let's say, the bacterial hijack. Um, the bi bacterial can't talk. The bacterial hijack requires a sequestration of the immune system and a forcing of a type 1 M1 response. So that's what I just kind of said. So it's whoop, I want to force you over to M1 if I'm a bacteria. And then I can kind of de develop strategies and defend myself against that. I can't really defend against an M2 because once you understand who I am, then you can kill me. So bile acids, and in particular, lithocholic acid, we're going to talk a lot about lithocholic acid, stimulate an M2 response, which is beneficial in fighting bacteria and breaking the bacterial hijack. So we want an M2 response if you have cancer, if you have any kind of chronic disease, if you have IBS, if you have Crohn's, it doesn't really matter. It's all the same stuff, boys and girls. And we want to be able to break the bacterial hijack. There's no magic bullet here. There's no, you know, sudden answer. But absolutely, lithocholic acid is part of the picture here and something we need to be concerned of and aware of in this sort of theory, let's say, of bacterial hijack and kind of the things we need to get in the middle of in order to fix this. But this is a big one, a big, big, big one, all right? Um, so bile acids and immunity. So let's talk about that. Um, so bile acids, LCA and DCA can inhibit the NLRP3 inflammasome. So if you're familiar with cancer, if you're familiar with any kind of chronic disease, any kind of chronic inflammation, uh, autism, anything like that, you will be well aware of the NLRP3 inflammasome. 
So in the bacterial hijack, that pathway is activated and adds to the pathology of the bacterial hijack. So again, when that gets activated, that helps cancer, that helps uh, disease, that helps bacteria. They want you to be inflamed because that helps their situation. And again, we've talked about that with LPS and we've talked about that with a lot of other sort of mechanisms that these bacteria use in order to get us. In cancer, which is just another form of the bacterial hijack, the NLRP3 pathway is activated. So meaning that cancer kind of needs that pathway going and that's part of its pathology or part of its existence. Now in the graphic, I want you to look at something. So look at the little purple Pac-Man guy over there called FXR. So that is, again, I'm gonna, I will butcher the name of the receptor. You can look him up and try to pronounce him on your own. Uh, but he's associated also with your retinoid receptor, RXN receptor, um, and RXR, I think, RXR receptor. But um, the RXR receptor is your light receptor. So your light receptor is tightly tied to FXR. And again, you guys are gonna hear it about light and hear it about the sun and hear it, hear it about you know how all of that interacts with us a, a lot. But FXR is tied to RXR very tightly. But anyway, look at how FXR there is reacting, and that's what this graphic is about, reacting to bile salts and shutting down the inflammasome, okay? And in two ways, right? So in, in, in two, different, two different mechanisms of action. So what we're always looking for here and how you work and you know, how do we sort of, um, why are we breaking? You know, why is not every cell striving toward perfect? Why are we all sort of, you know, why do we age? Why do we, you know, dive down, not, you know, climb up? Well, it's because we don't understand and we understand this at some level. Again, I'm pulling research that you know people have created around this, so somebody understands this. But again, it, we're we're being so misled and mistaught here. Okay, um, and, and and you know, health and wellness is about our immune system and, and about defending ourselves against these uh, pathological bacteria. Nothing more than that. So the more that we understand this, the more we can defend ourselves against disease and also overcome the disease. So look at this FXR receptor. So again, like I say over here, if I'm a bacteria, man, I'm gonna shut this guy down. Look at what I impact, right? So vascular uh, regulation of vas vasco re re reactivity, um, arthrosclerosis. So again, when you're you know sort of improving here, but I can hijack your bone health, I can hijack your vascular health, I can hijack your central nervous system. I can hijack your pulmonary. I can hijack your renal. I can hijack your bone. And again, part of the metastasis of this bacterial hijack is bone. And look at this, it has to do with even the breasts. So your estrogen you know, status and all that. So uh, all of this is influenced and affected by this FXR receptor. Um, and look at this. So not only is this guy tied to your retinoid receptor, which receives light from the sun and sort of is our sun signaler, um, but it's also tied to vitamin D, which is our sort of, uh, you create vitamin D from sterol, you know, cholesterol, let's say, um, synthesized cholesterol inside your body, but sterol that's, you know, close to your skin and you create vitamin D when you get out in the sun. And that's part of our natural process. And this receptor is tightly tied to the VDR receptor, okay? So, and this ties literally our bile to the sun and again, purposeful misspelling of the bright shiny ball in the sky. The vitamin D uh, receptor is super important to our immunity, and again, if you've studied vitamin D, most of us know this, but you know, if you study vitamin D, you know. Um, and you know, vitamin D is built from cholesterol, right? So our interaction with the sun and cholesterol build vitamin D. Now, look at this. So this FXR receptor, again, this is your bile receptor, okay? 
So your FXR receptor, look at how it's tied to cancer. It's tied to every single type of cancer. Okay, so if it's overexpressed, pancreatic cancer. If it's underexpressed, prostate, you know, it's gonna sort of go down. But you can kind of see the incidence there of cancer associated with this FXR expression. If it's underexpressed, you can see in the blue. If it's overexpressed, you can see that in the whatever color that is, uh, brownish red, let's say. Uh, let's read this though. One of these, one of those alterations associated with cancer corresponds to differential expression of the farsinode. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right. I'm sorry, but X receptor FXR, a nuclear uh, receptor regulating bile, cholesterol, homeostasis, lipid, and glucose metabolism. FXR is known to regulate several diseases, including cancer. Okay, FXR is known to regulate several diseases, including cancer, and cardiovascular disease anyone out there vaccinated anyone out there worried about their heart condition this is kind of a receptor you need to know about uh, the two highly reported causes of mortality globally recent studies have shown the association of X fxr overexpression with cancer development and progression in different types of cancers of breast lung pancreas and esophagus it has also been associated with tissue specific and cell specific roles in various cancers. It has been shown to modulate several cel cellular signaling pathways such as EGFR, look up if that's associated with cancer, NFKB, look up if that's associated with cancer, MAKP, look up if that's associated with cancer, PI3K, look up if that's associated with cancer. When, and that's associated with clock, WNT is clock, circadian, all that. Jack Stat is absolutely associated with cancer, MMP, cyclins, tumor suppressor proteins. Like P53 is a magical protein that I have to hijack if I'm a bacteria in order to really get you. Um, and they do. And again, it's uh, becoming more obvious what they do and kind of uh, how they how they get us. But it has to do with our DNA, <laughs> believe it or not. So it's they get us at the DNA level um, anyway. But uh, yeah, therefore, FXR has high potential as a no as novel biomarkers for the diagnosis, prognosis and therapy of cancer. Yeah, think you think this will be in my PCR test? Yeah. I think it will be. Um, this will certainly be one of the genes that we express for or uh, test for in our uh, cancer uh, PCR, you know, sort of cancer screening test that we're getting ready to come out with. So, yes, we'll be looking at these and other very important genes. Um, and again, this will be a very good indicator if you've got this gene under or over expressed, and we'll be able to tell that with this test that would give you a risk factor for all of these cancers. So isn't that cool, right? And this is the stuff that's coming, boys and girls. We just gotta, you know, again, uh, this, it isn't in the best interest of pharma to tell you this. So why are they gonna, you know, develop a test? First of all, through their research and university and all that. And then why is the NIH gonna pay for one? Because pharma pays for the NIH. So it, this ain't gonna come through normal channels it's going to come through private funding or you know people who believe in this or a bunch of us getting together and just you know not caring about business or cost and making sure it happens um, and that's probably the most likely way because there are people like me who don't give a crap about all that other stuff um, so anyway uh, we'll do that <laughs> that's already kind of happening Okay, so LCA, what is LCA? It's lithocholic acid. So this is something that is broken down um, by bacteria, but is extraordinarily beneficial to us. Now, please don't go out and look for the, you know, it's Ruteraris, I think, that does this. I mean, you can look it up pretty easy, but don't go out and start eating a bunch of Ruteraris to produce LCA. That's, that's not the way to skin this cat. But I just do want you, and sorry for that analogy, that's not the way to fix this problem. Um, I love cats, uh, love dogs, love animals. Um, so that's not the way to fix this problem, right? So this problem needs to be fixed really um, 
probably not with commiserate bacteria. It needs to be fixed with understanding the problem and then finding ways that your natural immunity without some foreign invader um, can fix the problem. Uh, so I, I think this is, you know, this stuff to me is deeply spiritual. It, we're talking about kind of possession and we're all possessed, you know, I can show you what I'm sort of got going on inside of me or Cindy or anyone else. Uh, but we need to understand our processes here so that we can cleanse ourselves, you know, so we can cleanse our temple, so to speak. But uh, uh, lithocholic acid is a, is a big deal. So, and again, look at this. Lithocholic bile acid has been reported to selectively kill cancer cells within many tumor cell lines, including neuroblastoma or glioblastoma. Now, if you know about cancer, uh, that's a freaking outstanding and extraordinarily powerful statement. Nothing kills glioblastoma. Um, you know, and so if you've got the child out there that has glioblastoma, well, look at this statement, okay? So LCA showed a dose and time-dependent selectivity, selective effect, sorry, inducing apoptosis, death, in nephroblastoma cells. However, these effects were not limited to the nephro, this are, these are cells that they built, nephroblastoma cell line, but also affected control kidney cell lines and the sarcoma cells. On, only uh, podiocytes are significantly less affected by LCA. So again, it's gonna, you know, it kills other cells, let's say. There were no significant differences regarding the TGR5 receptor expression. I don't know why they were looking at that. The study showed that LCA has a strong yet unselective effect on all used in vitro cell lines, sparing the highly differentiated podiocytes in lower concentrations. Further studies are needed to verify our results before dismissing LCA as an anti-cancer drug. So what this is saying is kind of a negative study. They're saying, oh, well, it affects all cells. Well, again, everything that I found says that LCA, pushing the LCA button is a very good thing for all cancer. The other thing that LCA does, and, and again, in research, this is hard to find. I mean, this is not like, um, uh, you know, hopefully you guys are getting it. If you just go out and look and say, oh, well, how do I kill my cancer? You're not gonna run across lithocholic acid this is deep in the weeds, boys and girls. And, and, and you know, hopefully you appreciate me digging it out for you, but, but it, that's kind of what I do. Um, but you're not gonna find this anywhere. You know, so some of these studies are skewed. It depends on who paid for them. You know, if the NIH or, you know, Fauci's group and the NSAID paid for them, do you think they're gonna be, you know, studies in your benefit? Um, you know, maybe, maybe not. Okay, so look at this. LCA controls adaptive immune response. Oh, what? Remember what I was saying back here about all this immunity and you know you don't want to sort of get stuck in a in a in a in a M1 response. You want to be able to have an M2 response. Oh, this is how it's controlled with bile, with bile salts and bile acids. Bile acids are established signaling molecules next to their role in the intestinal emulsification and uptake of lipids. We found that unconjugated lithocholic acid, LLCA, impedes Th1 activation as measured by decreased production of Th1 cytokines, IFNY and TNF-alpha, decreased expression of the Th1 genes, T-box protein, expressed in T cells. Again, they're polarized. Decreased stat uh, one AB phosphorization. So again, this has to do with phosphorization as well. And this is how things change at the highest levels above any kind of central nervous system or signaling or pharmacological levels. It's cellular membrane stuff. That's how these guys interface with us. It beats any pharmacology because it's a higher level and a higher truth than that. Hopefully you guys are getting that. Um, importantly, we observed that LCA impairs Th1 activation at physiologically relevant concentrations. 
These data reveal for the first time that LCA controls adaptive immunity via inhibition of Th1 activation. What? Bile! And again, this is produced by bacteria, so I'm certain this isn't the only way. Uh, but anyway, it's a way, uh, so that is good. So this is, everybody should be woohooing about this, because again, this is a cancer solver. This is a adaptive immunity sort of initiator. That's a good thing. Many factors influence LCA levels, including bile acid-based drugs and gut microbiota. Our data may suggest that these factors also impact on adaptive immunity via a yet unrecognized LCA THC cell axis. And you can look up that study. So how does this work, right? How does this work in nature? You know, how do we kind of get on God's natural system here? Well, the first way is to understand how we work. And then the second way is to really understand what's out there that influences how we work. Are there natural products that can get in the middle of this bacterial hijack as to your liver receptor or this farsinone X receptor, FXR? Yeah, lots of them. Again, I, I always had this theory, you know, God wouldn't be so cruel as to uh, make an effector and make you have to walk to India to get it or Africa or the Amazon. It, it just doesn't work that way. It, you know, within, I don't know what the square miles are, five square miles, you should be able to walk and find whatever you need to be able to heal yourself. That's God's system. That's God's system of nature. So uh, in this review, they aim to survey natural products originating from ter terrestrial plants and microorganisms, marine organisms, and marine-derived microorganisms, which could influence the liver and farsenod receptors. In the recent two decades, 2000 to 2020, 261 natural products were discovered from natural resources such as LXR, FXR modulators, 109 agonists, that means stimulators, and 38 blockers, and we want blockers for FXR, uh, targeting LXRs and 72 agonists and 55 blockers for FXR. So there's 55 blockers out there in nature that will kind of do what this LCA, this lithocholic acid does that is produced by bacteria. That's what I'm telling you. Okay, all you pharmacologists go to it, right? So let's, let's see it produce something. Uh, this docking evaluation of desired natural products targeted LXRs, FXRs is finely discussed. Anyway, you can read about that discussion in that study. Okay, so let's go personal experience. So again, it, this is a good strategy to be able to break this bile, let's say strategy and getting in the middle of bile and kind of understanding the bacterial hijack as to sort of what direction the bacteria want you to go and then see it if you can get yourself to go the other direction. Um, Cindy and I, I found some effectors that are terpenes, um, cannabis terpenes or plant terpenes. Again, uh, geraniums uh, have one of these terpenes in them. And, 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 and uh, I love this little uh, drinking water fountain emoji, by the way, that's in Keynote, because it looks like someone throwing up. Um, so, so this is Cindy and I, uh, although I didn't throw up, but she did, um, several days ago, she's laughing in the background. So she also, I should have another kind of thing coming out the other end there, but, um, lymphatic purge, you know, so if you guys have ever uh, uh, familiar with the term lymphatic purge, it, that's what happened when we took these terpenes, but you, I absolutely felt, you know, an adjustment, let's say, in my um, bile acids, you know, how my digestive fluids, let's say, were affected in a big way. But this is one of the things that happens when you kind of have a lymphatic purge is you get adjusted, you know, to your bile, your mucus, and, and these sort of exit systems that we don't really think about, our urinary system, that are super important to our immune health and all that. Okay, so, so I told you about what Cindy and I did. The, we experienced a lymphatic purge, and Cindy was a little worse than I. Um, she had, she had, but she has worse, I would say, bacterial hijack symptoms than I do. 
Um, and, and, and I want you guys to consider this, you know, what does an immune response look like? I mean, you just feel good all of a sudden. Does it immune response look like fever? Yeah, we know it does. Does it look like stomach ache? Does it look like throwing up? Does it look like, you know, muscle ache? Yeah. That's an immune response. That's an immune response to fever, you know, virus or whatever, right? Or well, fever is an immune response to a virus. So, you know, was this good or bad, the result that we got? Well, I'd say it was good because we had an extreme immune response. So we'll see in our testing and stuff, and obviously I'm gonna keep you guys informed, um, but you know, we're, we're on this road with you and we're traveling it you know trying to give you you know our personal experiences as we begin to wake up our uh, personal experiences as, as, as i gain knowledge and, and and kind of what we go through to improve our own health so anyway hope you guys have enjoyed this one we probably did ah we're kind of right on time but you know we're a little long anyway see you guys later thanks we'll see you next week for another chip talks might do mucus might not we'll see